could watch our Lunch and Laws on live stream, and so you don't have to worry about YouTube taking them down. Constant harassment by all agencies of Facebook and Twitter and all these things. It's unbelievable when you get into it. We've got about yeah. a dozen cases to get through here. Most of the lower courts, the majority said, maybe it's a little crazy, but we think the law is ambiguous, so we're going to apply Chevron deference. I hope Chevron is overturned. When it gets to the Supreme Court, the agencies change their tune. They're like, Chevron, is that a case? I'm not familiar with that case. You know? An administrative stay means, hey, we got to read this stuff. You guys file a lot of pages, <laughs> and, and we do. Good afternoon and welcome to the new Civil Liberties Alliance for today's Lunch and Law program. The topic today is the long conference and beyond what's next at the United States Supreme Court. And here to discuss that topic, we have three of the finest litigators NCLA has to offer. Uh, to my immediate left is Russ Ryan, Senior Litigation Counsel uh, here at NCLA. Next to him uh, is Richard Samp, and on my far left, which I can't say very often, is John Vecchioni. <laughs> also, uh, both of them are also Senior Litigation Counsel uh, here at, uh, at NCLA. There's a, a theme that has been developing for the upcoming term, which is that it promises uh, to be a major term for those of us who care deeply about the administrative state. And I don't mean those who care administratively about the deep state. That's, that's something different. But, <laughs> but we will be focusing on those administrative law cases uh, today, as well as a few other key ones. And we're going to be talking both about cases that have already been granted, as well as, as some of the cases that are pending uh, in the long conference and, and maybe some of the conferences immediately uh, after the long conference. Uh, but as I said, John, uh, one, of the, one of the big themes this year uh, is administrative law, and part of the reason for that is because it appears, if it's not a loosely with the football situation, it appears that the court may be poised uh, to overturn Chevron deference, and that's a case uh, near and dear uh, to your heart, Loper Bright uh, v. Raimondo. So can you tell us uh, what's going on there? So they have, uh, the court has taken uh, only a Chevron question, and I'll, I'll read the question presented in Loper Bright, and I'll say a little bit about the case, but the question presented is whether the court should overrule Chevron or at least clarify that statutory silence concerning controversial powers expressly but narrowly granted elsewhere in the statute does not constitute an ambiguity requiring deference to the agency. Now, there were two questions presented. The other was whether uh, Chevron had been properly used to, uh, to um, to interpret the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which the case is about, and they said, no, they totally took, is Chevron viable, basically? So uh, that said, the, the fact that they excised the one and took this, I think is, uh, unless it's a complete head fake, uh, really uh, good news that they're looking at this. And there's two, uh, there's, they, the one is overrule it, the other is the statutory silence provide any power to the administrative agencies. And I think those are both powerful questions, either one of them would be cert worthy, and here we have both. Yeah, it could it could cabin Chevron substantially, or it could eliminate it entirely. Right, and I'll just give a little background of the case so that you know if, if you haven't followed this. But there are uh, herring fishermen uh, out in this case. There is in New Jersey, and um, the Magnuson Stevenson Act in 1996 was amended that to make it clear that the government could require. Uh, observers, government observers on your boat to make sure you're fishing properly and how many how many fish you're taking and this sort of thing. Uh, and that has been in the statute a very long time. Come 20 years later, the uh, NOAA and the commerce and, and the uh, administrative agencies involved decided they wanted more observers on the boat. And, and just to clarify for those who are not steeped in uh, DC <coughs> acronyms, NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. All right. I always say, if you read the Dirk Pick novels, Raising the Titanic, it's always them, and they're doing daring do, but usually they're doing bad things to the fishermen uh, in any event. I just like suing Noah, because it sounds very Old Testament. <laughs> so anyway, he only took two. He should have taken four. Anyway, I, I, think, I think that the real, the real um, uh, so, so in any event, they had never complained about having the observers. Uh, it, it, no one had opposed it that I know of being put in the statute, but the administrative uh, uh, structure decided they wanted more of these observers than Congress would pay for, and they say, we can charge industry. 
And so uh, that has been- uh, Not just industry, but each individual boat, yeah, right? Yeah, each I mean, boat. And, and you're not always picked. Some boats are picked more often, so it's really not fair because it costs $750 a day, which is more than the profit margin for some of these, these boats. And in other parts of the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, uh, the Congress has allowed observers to be paid by industry, but they've capped it at two to three percent um, of, of the revenues and things like there's other there's other percentage caps up in Alaska and places like this, but they're all low. Here it's it they the, the agencies admit it's twenty percent of of the of the um, capital intake. When the caps so, are set by people who don't get voted on, then the caps are set higher. That's exactly right. So yeah. th so there's that. The, the fact that these are uh, these margins of costs are uh, uh, scaled up way higher than anything that's in the statute elsewhere, not for this fishery, not here, um, it, it, it shows the sheer strength of Chevron to take something completely out of, how were the herring fishermen ever to oppose this before Congress? How could they make their concerns known? There's a democratic problem here because the herring fishermen could not make their concerns known because you can't read the statute and see that you're going to pay for it. So that's what's going on here. I think they have a yeah. powerful case. It was brought by Cause of Action, where I formerly was. They've brought it all the way from the from uh, long ago in the D.C. District Court all the way up. Paul Clement has taken the case. Uh, I think it's going to be a barn burner, and I think that the facts of how much the agencies have put on, on these uh, basically small uh, owners of fisher boats is going to be uh, powerful. And I think the facts of how much the administrative state has taken away from Congress and taken away from the people to be even, e even heard is, is going to be a powerful argument. Now, we have to be quick because we've got about yeah. a dozen cases to get through here. But in addition to filing an amicus brief in Loper Bright, NCLA has also fi filed a cert petition on behalf of our clients in the Relentless case. Can right. you talk about and that? And I'll just say that. I'll say, so Relentless, we filed this uh, at almost just a little bit later than they filed Loper Bright, but we filed it up in the First Circuit. And the courts, both the First Circuit and the D.C. Circuit, have kind of relied on Chevron deference. The First Circuit in Relentless has even said, oh, anytime you have a cost, you can put it on industry, which I think is devastating. So we have, we have petitioned the Supreme Court in our case, and the government has just responded in Loper Bright and in the Relentless case to the petition for cert on Friday. And they basically say, Res judicata and, and uh, stare decisis is, is what I should have said. Stare decisis and also um, it's really important that there's reliance interests on Chevron because the agencies have relied on it. Uh, and, and also they say Congress could change it, which is interesting because sometimes they say not. Here the government's taking the position Congress can change this. Most of us think the APA already says this. So that's what's going on. Relentless, well, we will we will maybe put a reply. I'm not going to say, but... Uh, but the fact of the matter is one thing the government says that I will, I'll end with is in, uh, in their response, they say that, hey, the portion of this program that we've put in to charge the fishermen that, um, that the government does have to pay for, we admit the government has to pay for, has never been funded by Congress. So it's no big deal. But they want Chevron deference <laughs> against Congress for something Congress has for now seven years not never funded. funded. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's I think that's a, a huge problem. And uh, for those who are interested in sort of the uh, the, the backstory, uh, there's a previous lunch in law that we did with uh, with our clients uh, in the relentless case. And there's also the best picture winner from 2022, Coda, uh, that tells the story of fishermen who are subject to this kind of regulation. So I recommend that uh, to you as well. Uh, but stay tuned. I think John's right. This will be a barn burner, and we'll see. I think that uh, you know whether they grant relentless. Now or not, I think they'll at least hold it to see what happens even, in Loper Bright. Even the government says that they should hold it. And I will say one last thing. Loper Bright has asked that this not be remanded if they do win on Chevron, that it completely be reversed. So I thought that was interesting as well. They want, they want a real big message to the D.C. Circuit. Very good. Well, Rich, uh, probably uh, you know, almost as big, if not right there uh, next to, to overturning Chevron, would be striking down the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's uh, method of, of funding, uh, which is unique and a method that's not used by any other agency in the federal government. And that's really an issue in the CFPB v. Community Financial Services Association of America case. Can you tell us about that one? Sure. That case is going to be argued right at the beginning of the term on October 3rd. 
Uh, and in that case, the, the big issue <clears throat> is the appropriations clause of the Constitution, which says that no funds are supposed to come out of the U.S. Treasury except pursuant to an appropriation by Congress. Well, the problem is far... Or if Noah says it can do it on a... No, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> the problem as far as uh, uh, pro-administrative uh, state people in Congress is concerned is that sometimes uh, their favorite agencies don't get the funding that they want because, after all, Congress has to pick and choose how federal money is uh, uh, going to be spent because there are some limits on the federal government, even though it may not seem that way uh, in terms of what the overall budget is. Uh, so what happened uh, during uh, the aftermath of the uh, 2008 financial crisis when uh, Democrats overwhelmingly controlled both houses of Congress, they created this new agency, the CFPB, that basically controls all uh, companies that are involved with consumer finance. And uh, it, it wanted to make sure that this agency had all the money it could ever want and that future Congresses would not be able to change that. And so what they did was to say that CFPP is exempt from normal appropriations. Instead, it can establish its own budget. And it gets its money from the Federal Reserve, which itself is an, an independent group that gets funding not directly from Congress. And uh, the only limitation is that uh, they can only ask for up to 12% of the uh, Federal Reserve's revenues every year. And the Federal Reserve has to give whatever they ask for. Well, 12% of their revenues is no limit at all. Uh, it's pretty clear from the legislative history that when this law was established, uh, they chose an amount they knew would be well in excess of whatever CFPB could want in any given year. And if they thought it was not enough, they, they would have established a higher percentage of, of the Federal Reserve's revenues. So the question is whether or not this law violates the, uh, uh, the appropriations clause. We have a case uh, involving a very small a businesswoman who formerly ran a uh, law firm in New York that at one time was, was reasonably profitable, uh, but then CFPB didn't like the business she was in, which was to assist in collecting loans. And uh, CFPB has long taken the, the position that uh, I guess loans ought to not to be repaid except to the extent that the consumers are willing and able to do so. They never accused our client of violating uh, any federal law involving debt collection, but what they did was to inundate her with requests for uh, documents for her to write lengthy reports about the way her business operated. And what she told them was, you know, you're gonna drive me out of business if you require me to do all of this. And they said, okay, well then go out of business, which eventually she had to do because she lost her challenge in the second circuit. And just about the, the uh, same time that she was driven out of business, there was another case coming out of the Fifth Circuit, and that is the uh, case that's now before the Supreme Court. There was a trade association that was challenging one of the regulations that was issued by the CFPB, and among their challenges to it was that uh, CFPB has no right to operate because it gets all its funding in violation of the Appropriations Clause. And the uh, Fifth Circuit agreed with that argument and put on hold the regulation at issue. Well, if the, the Supreme Court upholds the Fifth Circuit, uh, that's basically going to put the, the CFPB out of business until Congress changes the law. Moreover, it uh, will call into question everything the CFPB has ever done, including all of the uh, documents that it, it was able to uh, successfully demand from our clients. So, and the reason the Supreme Court heard this case was there was, a cert, there was a circuit split. The Second Circuit had upheld the funding structure. The Fifth Circuit said no. So they, they granted review to, to resolve that conflict. Uh, in many case, ways, our case would have been a much better case but to get before the Supreme Court because uh, instead of being a large trade association, uh, our client is a you know, small businesswoman who was driven out of business by, the, uh, by being hounded by the CFPB. Uh, 
the biggest issue for the court, I think, is going to be not so much does this funding structure here uh, seemingly violate the appropriations clause, which it clearly does, because this funding does not come from Congress, uh, but rather, what about all the other agencies like the Federal Reserve that, that perhaps are not as extreme as the way that uh, CFPB is funded, but uh, nonetheless might be subject to challenge if the uh, CFPB funding structure is struck down. And, uh, I, you know, I got to say, I don't find that very compelling. So the post office gets money for selling stamps and it uses that to fund the post office. And that's supposed to allow the CFPB. How about the Federal Reserve, though? That's well, the dangerous yeah, one. Yeah, and, and so I, I suspect that. Oh, well, I can't leave that unanswered. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, one one factor on the Federal Reserve yeah, is. No, I think it has to be answered. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the Federal Reserve gets its funding directly from the banks, and, and the CFPB is indirectly. So you have two steps removed. And it's providing a service to the banks. It is. And there's also a board of governors. I knew and, the answer. I just thought. <laughs> <laughs> there's a board of governors, like 12 or 13 governors. So it, it has a little more of that independent agency flavor, which the CFPB does not. So there are lots of ways that the court can distinguish the Federal Reserve from the CFPB if it chooses to do so. So but there will be oral arguments coming up uh, in two weeks. And so we can expect no later than June. Uh, the answer to the question of whether or not the CFPB is, is constitutional. This issue kind of came before the court a couple of years ago in a case called Salo Law that was challenging the uh, constitutionality of CFPB on another ground. So the, the director of the CFPB uh, has or did have tenure protection. He could not be fired by the president except for cause. The uh, Supreme Court uh, observed the unique funding structure, but didn't pass on on that constitutional issue. Rather, it said uh, it is unconstitutional for the director to have uh, uh, a tenure and, and not be able to be fired by the president. And what they did was to leave the CFPB uh, in business by saying, we're going to strike that provision. So here, uh, here and after, the, the president does have the right to uh, hire. But really, all that does is turn over the uh, funding power from the director of the CFPB to the president, which in many ways is worse, because now the president can uh, uh, determine on his own how large a budget the uh, CFPB is going to have. And Congress, yes, could theoretically change the law, but any law they pass could be vetoed by the president. So that's a a major constitutional impediment. Yeah, they've gone out of the out of the front <coughs> and into the fire. I think as far as uh, what Sale Law did to uh, uh, to this, uh, you know, I, the other thing that that has bugged me about this for a long time, really since the inception of the agency, is you had Congress acting when there were 59 senators from one party at a high water mark. They haven't had 59 senators since. They didn't have 59 senators for decades before that. They took this one moment in time and they froze it. And they said, we're going to use this period of time when we have absolute control over both houses of Congress to essentially freeze the funding for this one favored agency. And that can't be, I mean, they're deliberately doing an end run, not just around the appropriations clause, but around the fact that the House of Representatives is elected every two years precisely so that the people have control over the funding mechanism and the funding of the different agencies. And I think the Supreme Court really needs to, to, to see that. And then, Rich, you, you sort of mentioned the, the law offices of Crystal Maroney v. CFPB case, but we actually filed a cert petition in that case. So that is pending right. as well. Right. That case is before the court. Uh, as with the relentless case, the Supreme Court tends to take, first of all, if the federal government seeks review, it, it uh, grants it, which has happened in our case. They also tend to take the first filed case. The, uh, the case on the Fifth Circuit, the cert petition was filed first. So they agreed to hear that case and to put ours on hold. Right. So we'll see. If, if, but if the court does the right thing in the CFPB case, then hopefully it will grant law offices Chris Maroney and send that one back to the Second Circuit. Right. And vacate the Second Circuit decision. And hopefully we will get relief. Now, the, the third case uh, that, that is really a blockbuster from the administrative law perspective in the coming term uh, is SEC v. Jarkissi. And Rich, can you tell us what's the issue in, in that Sure, that's basically a challenge to the way the SEC and many other independent agencies have conducted their own hearings over the years. Uh, one might think that since the Seventh Amendment provides a right to a trial by jury in all trials uh, involving issues covered by the common law, 
that uh, if the SEC wanted to uh, fine a company for allegedly violating the securities laws, that they would have to go into court and and uh, seek their fines that way. And that's the way that the SEC operated for many years. Well, in 1978, in a, a case called Atlas Roofing, the Supreme Court said for the first time that, well, that Seventh Amendment right doesn't apply to a certain category of cases that we call uh, public rights. And, uh, and the definition of what is a public right has never been clear ever since then. And the SEC hit upon that and said, oh, well, we think the securities law creates public rights. So they changed the way they operated so that they don't have to go into court to seek fines and other remedies. Instead, they have the right uh, to go into uh, their own administrative proceedings. And the trial doesn't take place before a jury, rather it takes place before an administrative law judge, who, by the way, is appointed by the SEC, so they have a very strong vested interest in and ruling. Paid. <laughs> paid by the SEC. To rule in favor of the SEC. And everybody <laughs> knows that you can't win in front of the uh, ALJ, and the best you can hope for is to appeal a decision all the way into the courts of appeals from a final decision of the SEC. Um, Which and, George Jarkissi did. Yes, and he won his case in front of the uh, Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit said the system is wrong for three different reasons. First of all, they, they cited the Seventh Amendment argument that I'm, I'm citing that, uh, that really for these kinds of of uh, cases that raise common law issues, you do have a right to go into court. Secondly, uh, it, uh, it really is a violation of the non-delegation doctrine because uh, basically uh, what Congress has done is to delegate to the agency the right to decide where they're going to enforce it. And they don't give any sort of intelligible principle to guide uh, the SEC in how to do it. Uh, and so that that is a, also a violation of separation of powers. Uh, uh, and then the third issue they raise... Because is, they get to decide whether to bring it in front of the ALJ or bring it in federal district court, right. essentially. Yeah, and then... And the, the citizen doesn't. Right. That's right. They have no such right. They just have to go where the SEC takes them. Which turns your jury rights into options. Rather than have the right to a jury, the government gets to decide, oh, well, we can pursue you in district court and give you jury rights, or we can just take them away by going in front of an ALJ. And that's not the way rights are supposed to work, obviously. And the third issue they raised was the same issue that came up in sale of law involving uh, uh, double layers of, of uh, or, or tenure protection. Here, there's a double layer of protection because the ALJ can't be fired except for good cause. And the only one who can fire them is the uh, uh, Merit Protection Board. And their members are also protected uh, from uh, from being fired except for good cause. Uh, that double layer of protection was uh, 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 struck down in a case called uh, FEF versus PCOB a couple of years ago, and it would seem to me that the, uh, the same logic would apply there. Now, as Mark mentioned, Jarkissi has already been through the entire process, uh, and uh, so there's some question about whether or not they're entitled to relief uh, uh, based on a case that the Supreme Court decided a couple of years ago called Collins. So the Fifth Circuit never really addressed the issue of uh, whether or not Jarkissi was entitled to relief based on this violation of separation of powers uh, and the, the, the double layer of, of tenure protection. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear that issue because the Fifth Circuit never fully decided the issue, it's possible that the Supreme Court will never get to that issue, and it won't have to if it rules in favor of Jarkissi on either of the other two issues. If I had to handicap it, I would say that their Seventh Amendment argument uh, that Jarkissi has made is uh, the, uh, uh, the stronger of the two, and I have a little bit of bias in that, in that uh, we here at uh, NCLA identified this Jarkissi case as a key one a long time ago, and we filed an amicus brief in the Fifth Circuit in support of Jarkissi and made a number of, of jury trial issues, many of which were adopted by the Fifth Circuit. So so we take partial credit for, for that, <laughs> that victory below, and, and we are getting ready to... Uh, 
file our brief uh, that, uh, again, on an amicus basis uh, uh, in the Supreme Court. We'll be filing that brief in the end of October. The Supreme Court has not yet set a, a uh, oral argument date for the case. Likely, given how few cases they have set to go up, come up in December, it, this will be argued in, in the December term. Fantastic. And I should probably mention our colleague Peggy Little has worked uh, extensively on uh, the Jarkissi case, and she would be here to talk about it, but she's on vacation. So uh, so have fun, Peggy. Uh, uh, Russ, you've been working on the Jarkissi issue as well. Do you have any thoughts to add to, to what uh, Rich uh, said about, yeah, about Jarkissi? Um, Jarkissi is also an opportunity. I don't know if you remember Justice Thomas's concurrence in, um, in the Cochran and Axon case, mm -hmm. where he really raised the bigger question of whether this type of adjudication has any business in an administrative context at all. And I think right. um, if he were inclined to elaborate on that or maybe get some of his colleagues to join him, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, yeah, that, that's a perfect vehicle for that, too, I think. That would be fantastic. Although, uh, you know, I would settle for uh, for kicking it out on any of the three grounds, including the double layers of protection from removal, because they could use that same logic against the CFPB. No double layers of protection for removal. Mm -hmm from removal for the ALJs, no double layers of protection from Congress on the funding side for CFPB. It's a nice, clean double win for the administrative state. Well, one other thing on Jarkassi. Against. I'm sorry, you're right, against the administrative state. Not, not only has he been, was he in the SEC labyrinth for years and years, yeah. but remember, he was one of the early ones who tried to go to district court like Michelle Cochran ultimately succeeded in. Right. Um, and he was turned down, I think, by the D.C. By circuit, the DC circuit. At yeah. Um, so, you know, he's he's taken it in all directions, basically. So. Yeah. And, he, and and kept on ticking. It's like the, uh, <laughs> and, and, the Timex yeah, watch. Yeah. Russ has brought up an issue that I think oftentimes arises in the Supreme Court. I referred to Jarkissi. He referred to Jarkissi. Oh, no, I'm and, wrong. And generally, those, no, but those kind of issues <laughs> generally know. only get decided when the case comes for oral argument. And then everybody <laughs> accepts whatever the lawyer for Jarkissi, Jarkissi says. That, that will be the official. But, but they've argument. never agreed on if it's amicus or amicus, have they? <laughs> But inside story, it's Jarkissi, because we've yeah. already talked to the lawyers. Yeah, Peggy uh, corrected me yesterday. And I, I, I it didn't take. It didn't take. <laughs> well, there's another case that they've already granted cert on, uh, Russ, that you were going to tell us about, a, an important tax case. Yeah, yeah. We're not involved in it, um, but it really is important and interesting. Um, if we were wealthier, we might be involved in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or a lowly public interest group. It basically deals with the, the, third, uh, the 16th Amendment, which sort of in my view, infamously authorized Congress to tax incomes for the first time. That does affect um, me. <laughs> it does, but um, it's generally been understood that income means something that you real a realized gain on something. For example, if you have property, it might appreciate in value over time, but until you sell it or transfer it and actually pocket those gains, um, the government can't tax it. It's not income yet. Uh, and, and that makes, you know, that makes some sense because investments go up and investments go down. So if, if you're taxing it when it's gained, does that mean you, you get a refund three years later if the stock tanks or your property value uh, goes down? Um, in 2017, um, there was all this hullabaloo about how U.S. corporations were sort of uh, hoarding their their gains and their caches in their overseas operations and not bringing them back to the United States, in part because our corporate tax rates are so punitive. Mm -hmm. So um, in 2017, Congress passed um, the corporate reform, uh, corporate tax reform litigation, and there was something in it called the mandatory re repatriation tax, which basically said, all right, if, if you're a U.S person and you have ownership of a foreign business that has accumulated earnings. So anytime over the past three decades, we're going to basically just magically call it income and tax you on it now. And it was supposed to be this big windfall. And of course, it was sold as this way to get at these gigantic, terrible multinational corporations based in the U.S. that were unpatriotically hoarding their cash overseas. Um, 
Of course, like most tax legislation, it also affected mom, moms and pops. So Charles and Kathleen Moore um, had a minority interest in some foreign business. And I guess IRS calculated over the preceding years, there'd been about $130,000 worth of gains that their share had accumulated. <coughs> So but they'd they never tax, seen any of this money. No, they'd never seen a dime. And it's not clear that the, the company would ever distribute any di dividends or other income to them. But they were caught up in this legislation. Uh, the IRS taxed them $10,000 on that increase in value, even though they'd never seen it. So they challenged it. Um, the Ninth Circuit um, basically said, well, Congress can define income the way it wants, um, and it's not a constitutional issue. The, the 13th Amendment, which- 16th. Allowed, 16th, well, I don't know yeah. why I keep saying 13th. Uh, <laughs> well, if they take all oh, your gains, oh, it I could be a 13th I Amendment know, problem, I right? I mean- <laughs> Just the way my brain works. It was passed in 1913, so I, That's right. I, I conflate those two things. Um, uh, <laughs> It all goes but back the, to Woodrow Wilson. That's, the, that's yeah. the theme here with the um, so problems the with the administrative state. Said, um, the Thirteenth Amendment, when it when it uses the word income, Sixteenth. Sixteenth. My goodness, <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to stop talking. About it. Uh, where it says we could, uh, Congress can tax income, that the notion of realization of that income is not constitutionally required. So, um, so the court yeah, has to decide whether it is or it's not. Yeah, and it's there's, there's huge ramifications for this case if if Congress can tax income that's not actually realized, that's sort of like the uh, the loophole for progressives to get any kind of wealth tax they want, basically. Yeah. And um, If you think Congress's appetite for taxation is voracious now, just wait until they get to unrealized <laughs> yeah, income. I, I mean, I don't, I don't see how it, it's limited. Well, this is their pay, plan to pay for the $33 trillion uh, debt, I think, so. Uh, so, uh, so that kind of, uh, you know, there are some other cases that have been granted, but those are the, the biggies that we thought uh, have the most impact on the administrative estate. But Russ, uh, what about pending cases? There's some of those. Uh, in fact, uh, you've you've authored a couple of cert petitions uh, yeah. against the SEC. Yeah, pending cert petitions. So uh, we've done two of them. I've done two of them in the last few months. Uh, I'll talk first about a case called Murphy against SEC. Um, which is an SEC enforcement case, another SEC enforcement case um, that arose from municipal bond sales. Um, we represent uh, one of the petitioners named Rick Ganod. We did not represent him in the lower courts. We just took him on at the search stage. Um, but he was charged by the SEC with only one violation, which is failing to register as an SEC, as a broker dealer with the SEC while he was selling municipal bonds. We think that that issue is wrongly decided too. Right. But what we're primarily focused on is how the penalty was calculated against him. Right, and this so, doesn't just affect him, this is all the SEC penalties, yes. they, and I interrupted you before you explained the penalty problem. Yeah, no, it's, um, Congress set a statutory cap for violations like this one, which do not involve fraud or other kind of misconduct. They're a dollar cap. Basically strict liability. Right. A dollar cap of, back in, back when it was established, I think it was $5,000. Today it's about $10,000 with automatic inflation adjustments. At the time of the conduct here, it was about $7,500. Per, per violation. Per violation, that's right. the problem. But yeah. Congress did not define per, what a violation is. And so over time, the SEC has taken liberties with that and been successful in convincing courts to allow them to define what a, each violation is basically on the whims of any given case. So, right. So with this guy, the, the accusation is that he wasn't registered as a broker dealer. So you could either come after him for 365 violations because he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, every day of the year he wasn't, or maybe... Right. 52 violations because every week of the year he wasn't, or maybe 12 violations because every month of the year he wasn't. It's it's just, it's yeah. arbitrary on the part of the SEC how many things did, he really only yeah. did one thing wrong, yeah. but they, it's, they it's come up with multiple violation. violations. And ironically, in the same case, someone who was charged with the exact same violation settled when the case was filed and paid $7,500. 
but he was penalized something like, I think it was $309,000 because he was unregistered for over 30 months while he was selling. And the, that's a, there's a circuit split on that issue because the DC circuit in 2012 in a case called Rappaport against SEC said you can't, you can't define a violation as a unit of time. That, that makes no sense and it makes, it's, not, it's atextual under the statute. So you, you do have a, a circuit split on that narrow issue, but we want the court to look at it even broader because the courts are all over the map in how to de define a, a, a violation. You mentioned various units of time which are arbitrary yeah. and can be manipulated. But in many cases, courts will say, well, each separate securities transaction was a separate violation or... Right, you were unregistered each, for 100 transactions or right. you were unregistered for 1,000 transactions, even though the two people might have both been unregistered for the same length right. of time or something. Or how many investors were involved. But the, the result is the penalties are wildly inconsistent, even for similar violations. And worse yet, they're totally unpredictable for people who are under investigation or have been charged and need to make an informed decision whether they want to settle and, and pay up front sure. or whether they, they want to roll the dice, defend themselves and litigate. Um, and the reality is in these cases, the SEC never says what penalty it's going to demand until the very end of the case after it's established liability and you're at the penalty stage. But, uh, and then they spring upon you what they think the penalty should be. And yeah. uh, courts, uh, unfortunately, tend to be um, credulous and- um, Particularly after credulous. liability, right? You've got liability, <laughs> right, right. oh, now yeah. I'm gonna say that's the story. So there, yeah. There's no predictability at, at all. It gives the SEC enormous settlement leverage. Absolutely. Because they say, you know, they'll they can throw multiply. a number at you and say, take it or leave it. Yeah. And, so know. that sounds like a very important case for the Supreme Court to take a look at. What, what about your other pending cert petition, Russ? Yeah, I've got another one that's um, Lemelson against the SEC, which is another SEC enforcement case. It's um, the SEC charged our client, who's a Greek Orthodox priest. Um, he also runs a hedge fund, um, a, sl <laughs> a, a slightly unusual combination of things. but. Some people have many gifts. <laughs> um, again, we did not represent him in the lower courts. Uh, we took him on at the search stage. Um, on, on a First Amendment issue. Yes, and here's what happened. Um, in his capacity as the hedge fund manager, I mean, his, his religious uh, vocation is really not all that relevant to the case at all. Good color. Um, <laughs> it makes it interesting, but it's not legally relevant. Um, but in his capacity as a hedge fund manager, um, he frequently writes commentaries about public companies, sometimes ones that he's either invested in or taken what is called a short position, which means- He's betting he, against them. Right, you're betting against them. So in this particular case, he took a short position uh, in a pharmaceutical company that's publicly traded. And then he goes out publicly and writes reports and gives interviews basically saying, here's why I think this company is no good. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lose money. Uh, and in this case, he was saying that they're in, involved in misconduct, too. Um, and he said, he, I have a short position. Exactly. Here's why he I'm taking the short he position. Yeah, no he deception there yeah. at all. Um, so lo and behold, over the next several months, the stock price does go down. So he and anybody who listened to him and believed what he had to say uh, had an opportunity to make a fair amount of money. Right. Um, the company obviously didn't like it, didn't like his criticism. Right. Um, but, but what's it, the First Amendment issue? Because we got a yeah. uh, bunch more cases to get right. to. So. It, could have, it could have spoken, you know, refuted him publicly. It could have sued him for defamation or what have you. Instead, it went and uh, enlisted the SEC to sue him and try to silence him. And ultimately, um, went to a jury trial. The jury rejected the SEC's fraud charges. So this is not a case within the fraud exception to the First Amendment, but it found that three sentences within his you know, 50 some pages of written reports and various oral interviews, three sentences were inaccurate and according to the jury, 
he knew or was reckless in not knowing that those three sentences were inaccurate. But so the First Amendment protects it, false speech. It, it does. And this is this is just a classic um, First Amendment case. He was punished for his past speech, and the court actually enjoined him from similar criticism of public companies. Which is a, a prior restraint. Years. So, um, you know, we really think it's important. Um, the government hasn't responded to the petition yet. I think it's due November 1st. Um, but we're really hopeful on that one, and um, I'm really excited about it. I really hope they take it. Yeah, I think, I think both those are fantastic cases. Rich, you mentioned earlier that, uh, that the government, or that this court rather, likes to take the first filed case. Well, you're in the fortunate position of having a cert petition that was the first filed uh, case at the Supreme Court. You want to tell sure. us about that one? The name of that case is uh, Garland versus Cargill. We represent Mr. Cargill who uh, owned a device called a bump stock, which for many years, as far as the uh, federal government was concerned, was a totally legal device. Uh, but then uh, some people thought maybe they aren't particularly safe, maybe they should be made illegal, but Congress didn't change the law, so the Trump administration- And they're for firearms. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the, the Trump administration uh, uh, said, well, since Congress hadn't acted, we're just going to unilaterally change the law. And the Biden administration has stuck with that position. Uh, and uh, the, so all the, the uh, owners of these bump stocks, which can be uh, attached to semi-automatic rifles, uh, were required either to destroy them or turn them into the federal government, which our client did. He turned it into the federal government and then he sued. And a number of people also sued. And for a number of years, these cases went forward. And there were a lot of judges who said this interpretation of the law by uh, AFT, uh, the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, uh, is crazy. Uh, uh, but uh, most of the lower courts, the majority, said, uh, well, maybe it's a little crazy, but we think the law is ambiguous. So we're going to apply Chevron deference, which uh, uh, John was referring to earlier, and we're going to uphold it. Uh, and so in the case of Mr. Cargill, uh, we had one case that we brought out in Utah, and we lost that case six to five in the in the Tenth Circuit. And Mr. Cargill brought his case in Texas, and we lost in the trial court. We lost in front of a three-judge panel, but we then convinced the Fifth Circuit to rehear the case on Bonk. It ruled in our favor 13 to three. Uh, and if you're wondering how bad our panel was, <laughs> three gives you some gives you some sense. Uh, in any event, the uh, uh, federal government, um, uh, Attorney General Garland, and that's who the petitioner in the in the case is, sought review in the case. Uh, since that uh, petition was filed, uh, the D.C. Circuit is now the only circuit in the country that has supported ATF. Uh, and so the uh, loser in that case has filed a petition in the Supreme Court raising the very same statutory interpretation issue. And uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit in a case called Hardin um, ruled our way, although that court didn't say the statute necessarily was our way. They just said, well, the, the statute is perhaps ambiguous. And so uh, they uh, decided to... Uh, uh, apply what's referred to as the rule of lenity, which is kind of the opposite of Chevron deference, which says that close decisions uh, involving the interpretation of a criminal law ought to be interpreted in favor of, of the uh, a person who is uh, challenging the criminal law rather than in favor of the government. Ours was the first of the three petitions to be filed Plus, it was filed by the Solicitor General, and they normally get their petitions granted. Plus, they are strongly urging that our petition be heard and that the other two be held. So I think it's likely by the end of October that our petition will be, uh, will be uh, granted and will probably be argued along about February of next year and decided by June. Now, this case involves the federal definition of the word machine gun. Uh, is it the most important administrative uh, issue around? Probably not, because uh, there isn't that much at stake. But I think it, what is at stake is a very important principle, which is that if Congress uh, writes the laws, it should be the one to change the laws if they think they're in, in, uh, in need of change. And instead, I think you find many people 
in the administrations, Republican and Democrat, uh, get frustrated with the, uh, the fact that Congress hasn't done what they want. And they say, OK, well, that's a reason for us to unilaterally change the law. And then <clears throat> between the Loper Bright case, which may be cutting back on Chevron deference, and our case, which may be reinvigorating the rule of lenity and saying that really close cases involving criminal statutes ought to be decided in favor of the uh, of the person challenging the criminal law, I think uh, uh, there is a highly, uh, uh, very good chance that the court is going to uh, say to the, the federal government, no, you've misinterpreted the law, and besides, it's not up to you to interpret criminal laws. Well, I think that's, that's, that's right. I mean, this, this interpretation by ATF turned half a million people into felons overnight. And I think that's a problem, and it's not something that the administrative state should be able to do. Congress needs to be the one that changes or, or expands a criminal law uh, to make the ambit encompass more, more people. That's not something that ATF should do, partly because ATF, part of the Department of Justice, is also the prosecutor uh, in those and, cases. And the funniest thing about this, and another, another reason the Supreme Court could take it is, in the military courts, they've applied lenity. So if you're in the military and you have one of these, you can't be criminally convicted. But if you're a civilian running around in the wrong circuit, you could be criminally convicted. That's right. The exactly. Navy Marine Corps Court of Appeals took a look at this exact issue. And you might think the military knows something about what is and what isn't a machine gun. And so they looked at this and they said, these are not machine guns. Uh, the military is not going to hand out bump stocks to our soldiers on the front lines because they aren't machine guns <laughs> and they're not uh, accurate. <laughs> and they're not accurate. They're, there's lots of things that distinguish them from being a machine gun. But in any event, the Navy Marine Corps Court of Appeals looked at this issue, said it's not a machine gun. This was in a, the context of a criminal prosecution. And the, they uh, overturned the prosecution of this soldier who was in possession of a bump stock, I guess, on a on a military base, or, or at least uh, because he was active duty. In their jurisdiction. He was in their jurisdiction. Uh, and guess what? The government didn't appeal that decision. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. So uh, that's, I think, maybe the, you know, if I were to say, what are the four most important administrative law cases in front of the Supreme Court this term? I think, I think Cargill will be one of those four, because I think this also has significant potential ramifications. If we can tell government agencies, you don't get to rewrite statutes, Congress has the privilege of doing that. That's a very important further restriction on the administrative state. John, you have another really important case that is already at the Supreme Court, right. uh, essentially, not, not, not really at not the Not by our doing. Yes, not at the, well, I guess <laughs> yeah. I would. Yeah, I'm not like are, these guys. I haven't lost cases, so I haven't been, you know. <laughs> no, what, no, you just, uh, what, what's what, you just what's keep that? winning at the I Fifth Circuit, winning. which is, so, so, um, some might say that's cheating, yeah, John. But, uh, yeah, exactly, we're tired, we're tired of it. We're tired of winning. Uh, no, uh, what's happened is this is the Missouri v. Biden case. And this is the case where you've probably seen in the newspapers, it's been very highly covered. Uh, Missouri and Louisiana, brought, uh, they were thrown off the internet for things they were saying, and they brought a case against the Biden administration for, uh, for uh, the federal government uh, putting so much pressure and almost commandeering these social media platforms on all these subjects where they didn't like what people were saying on the social media platforms that the uh, court has found, the district court has found that, listen, this was a violation of free speech. The government got too involved. This wasn't the government's own speech. This was the government stopping other people's uh, speech through threats and coercion and, and recommendations. And just the, the, the facts of this, the, the constant harassment by all agencies of Facebook and Twitter and all these things, it's unbelievable when you get into it. I, I always say all the lawyers who got involved in this case who you know had some suspicions have been shocked by how incredibly broad it was. Yeah. So they then lost again at the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit took out some of the agencies, it said the proof for these agencies, we, we're not going to keep these agencies in. But at they least kept not the, at the preliminary right, injunction stage. Right, preliminary injunction stage. But they kept the FBI and the White House, you know. And they said, listen, you can't be uh, doing this to the extent that it's going to be coercion against people's First Amendment rights. And the government still has been unable to say what the parade of horribles, what they want to do that's constitutional that they're not allowed to do by this injunction. But they have brought it to the Supreme Court in an emergency petition. Uh, a, a Justice Alito has a, a issued a administrative stay. And all that means is that they want time to look at it. 
nothing on the merits. Uh, I just say that because the press has been so bad on this issue. An administrative stay means, hey, we got to read this stuff. You guys file a lot of pages, <laughs> and and we do. So I, I think that I, I think that, and they haven't uh, seen it before. This is the first right. time the case exactly. has made it up there. It's, it's the first one. It's the first of its kind. First of its kind to make it this far. We have the Shingizi case, yeah. different story. But the um, so our brief in opposition to their request of a stay of the injunction is due today, as we're speaking, and it should be filed, you know, within the hours. So after you're done with this, you can go over to the Supreme Court uh, website and take a look at it. Or our website. We'll or have our it. website we'll should have it be there. Too, I think they'll get it first, work. but you're right. <laughs> so, so I think this is going to be a huge First Amendment case, and it's going to be huge in this area where the administrative agencies are really trying to constantly commandeer private action for things they couldn't do constitutionally themselves. And I think we're going to see more and more of this. And the Supreme Court has to get involved because you'll see if you go on the Internet now, they say, oh, private companies can do what they want. Yeah, that has always been everybody's view in a free society until the government has so put its tentacles into every aspect of every private action that it ceases to be private action. And that's what's happened here. I think you ought to emphasize, John, that we're just not simply tagging along oh. with, with uh, Missouri have, and Louisiana. We have our own right. clients. So we were at, and we came in with our, uh, their individual clients who were thrown off, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Koldorf, Jill Hines, she's down in Louisiana. She has all these political things, Aaron Carity. We, they have all been affected personally by this. So our standing arguments as to them as individuals are also there. And the government has attacked it. Ah, they don't have standing just because they've been silenced. Um, so I really think, uh, and I'm exaggerating, but you know, I represent clients, but I think this it's is the pretty gist, close to what this said, is the John, gist of their argument. <laughs> yeah, no, they, uh, they, they have done that. And for those who are interested in that particular issue, uh, I would direct you to our July lunch in law, uh, featuring John and uh, Jeanette Brown. Uh, and John Sauer, who's the lead attorney for Louisiana in this litigation. Which uh, was also temporarily kicked yeah. off of the internet. That's exactly what I was going to say. Is, uh, yeah, you know, if, if you weren't quick to watch it, you, this is why you should watch our Lunch and Laws on live stream, so you don't have to worry about YouTube taking them down. Uh, but YouTube took down that video for about 72 hours, uh, and uh, we appealed, and they said, nope, we're going we're gonna to keep it down. Uh, and then it mysteriously went back up anyway. But don't fear, the fact that it was down made it into the oral arguments in front of the uh, Fifth Circuit, <laughs> and it also is making it into uh, today's filing with the Supreme Court. So uh, thank you, YouTube, for taking <laughs> down our July Lunch and Law video and showing that your censorship yeah. of censorship is still happening. You know, it's, uh, or as they say to NCLE, not you, too. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So there's one other case that I wanted to, to talk about. We actually uh, filed a cert petition in earlier this week, so it, it's, it won't be in the uh, in the long conference, but it will be sometime this this fall after the uh, after the defendant has a chance to uh, to respond to it. And the case is Felkner v. Nazarian and uh, at Al. And the issue in this case uh, is that that our client uh, William Felkner uh, was a student at Rhode Island College in the uh, in the Department of Social Work uh, and was dismissed from the school because he refused to adhere to the progressive worldview that the college insisted was their perspective as a school, and that if you were going to be a student there, you had to adhere to that perspective, including doing things like testifying in front of uh, the state legislature in Rhode Island and, uh, and making your projects, including your, your, uh, you know, some of the things that you were turning in for grades had to, had to adhere to this uh, point of view. And you know, that struck us as a First Amendment problem, that uh, maybe the government shouldn't be uh, dictating uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And interestingly, it struck the Rhode Island Supreme Court that way too. In this case, went all the way up to the Rhode Island Supreme Court. The Rhode Island Supreme Court said, yes, indeed, this is a First Amendment violation. You have shown that. Sent it back down to the Superior Court, which then took another look at it and said, ah, but qualified immunity. Uh, there's no way that the school could have known that it was violating a student's First Amendment rights by telling the student uh, that he had no business sharing his own views on anything uh, as a student in the college. Uh, and then that went back up to the Rhode Island uh, Supreme Court, and I'm sorry to say that the Supreme Court of Rhode Island upheld the qualified immunity finding uh, in that case. So we have, um, we have filed a cert petition with the Supreme Court asking it to take a look again at the qualified immunity uh, issue. It's, it's, it's come too far 
when your First Amendment rights can be quashed by a state university and they get away with it because they can say, well, we had no idea uh, that, our, that we were you know, crushing someone's First Amendment rights uh, by doing this. That's hogwash. They knew damn well what they were doing. And to hide behind the skirts of qualified immunity is unacceptable. Now, the Supreme Court, uh, in the personage of Justice Thomas, has suggested that perhaps they need to take another look at qualified immunity in one particular respect, which is to say, if you have qualified immunity for officers in the field who have to make split-second life or death decisions, that might be one thing. That's not the same thing as giving qualified immunity to desk-bound officers, for example, these school officials who had all the time in the world to seek appropriate legal counsel and figure out whether or not what they were doing uh, was consonant with the First Amendment or was a blatant and direct violation of the First Amendment, which it was. Uh, so you know, we would, we would welcome the Supreme Court to say that irrespective of qualified immunity, this was a clear violation of the First Amendment and therefore qualified immunity doesn't apply. But we would be even more happy if the Supreme Court would say, look, qualified immunity shouldn't apply in these situations where you have a desk-bound official with all the time in the world uh, to seek legal counsel, because that's not the kind of situation that qualified immunity uh, was created for. The other interesting thing about this, and here I'll mention another qualified immunity case uh, that's, that's pending at the Supreme Court, that Neil Katyal, the former uh, Solicitor General of the United States uh, under uh, President Obama, uh, has filed uh, in a case called Rogers v. Jarrett. Uh, and uh, Rogers v. Jarrett was a case out of the Fifth Circuit in which uh, Judge Willett uh, wrote the decision, but then wrote a concurrence to the decision as well, saying uh, that there's some new scholarship showing that when Section 1983, which is the federal statute that allows you to, sh to sue state officials for violating your constitutional rights, when that was codified, that there was a piece of it that was left out of the codification. And uh, Judge Willett said that alone, this new scholarship alone, is a reason for the Supreme Court to take a look at qualified immunity again, because in this era of adherence to the original meaning of the statute and textualism, the fact that this was left out uh, is important. Now, uh, we, we agree with that largely, although we think it's a little more nuanced and a little more complicated than how I just uh, explained it. And you're welcome to read our cert petition in the uh, Feltner v. Nazarian case, which explains why we think that's a better vehicle to take a look at this uh, than is the Rogers v. Jarrett case. But just know that there are a couple of different cases raising this qualified immunity uh, issue that are in front of the Supreme Court and, uh, and that the court is being uh, invited uh, to do that. And then I think we have time maybe to just briefly mention uh, a couple of other cases. One of those is the Community Housing Improvement v. City of New York case. And this is the case that asks whether the rent stabilization law in New York City, rent control, uh, whether it is a physical taking or perhaps a regulatory taking. I think that's an issue that uh, is, is very important. It's an issue we filed, a, uh, we filed an amicus brief in that case in the Second Circuit when it was in front of, of the Second Circuit. We didn't file uh, in the Supreme Court at the cert stage. We often don't file at the cert stage. But certainly, if the court grants this one, we would uh, intend to file uh, at the merit stage uh, in the Supreme Court. And we would encourage the court to take a look at this, uh, at this rent control issue, which certainly seems like a physical taking uh, and, and pro pro possibly probably a regulatory taking as well. And then, Russell, there was one more case, Larrabee v. Del Toro, which uh, asks whether the Constitution permits military retirees to be tried by court martial. Uh, for offenses after they have left uh, active duty. I think that one's still pending uh, as well, yeah, if I understand uh, correctly. Um, all the cert stage briefing is done. It's on the conference for October 6th. Um, again, it, it affects, I think there's over 2 million military retirees. And um, I just kind of stumbled across the case earlier this week. And we just, it was a page turner for me. Just like, I'd never really thought about it, but all those people under the Uniform Code of Military Justice are at least theoretically subject to court-martial, which is not really a jury, it's not a jury proceeding for crimes they've committed even long after they've uh, left the military service. So it kind of follows military service members throughout their life and uh, just an interesting case. I encourage people to just read the petition at least. And, yeah, um, it's I don't really. I don't know if the issue comes up very often, but it's a very interesting uh, issue. We'll see what the court does with that one. 
uh, as well. Well, uh, we want to open it up to questions now uh, from the audience. So if there's anyone here who has a question about one of the uh, either one of the granted cases or one of the pending cases, we would be happy uh, to answer that. Um, I want to ask a question of Russ because Rich had mentioned earlier the the lenity issue in a criminal case. I was wondering, given that the Murphy, I think it's Murphy, is a civil case, is the, are there any legs for the argument that lenity might apply there too, to the extent there's an ambiguity? Yeah, I definitely think there is. Um, unfortunately, uh, nobody nobody preserved that issue, and so it's kind of it's it's too late to raise it now. I I would hope that people would raise it in the future, especially in areas and I've written about this. Like the law of insider trading is all based on Chevron deference. There's an admitted ambiguity as to whether the primary anti-fraud statute actually covers insider trading, or at least in misappropriation cases. And I think it should be negated by the rule of lenity, especially in criminal cases. But I've always argued that SEC civil cases, quote unquote, are effectively criminal cases. Well, it's, and some of these cases, uh, it's the same statute that governs whether both the criminal and the civil element of it. People may not realize that, but it, the statute has to be interpreted the same way in both the civil context and the criminal context. So even though the rule of lenity typically only applies to criminal cases, it still has to apply to civil cases if it's a statute that's also applied criminally because the interpretation has to be the same in both contexts. And that's actually uh, an, an issue in the, in the bump stock case as well because our clients, unlike the, unlike the, the military uh, gentleman who uh, was in front of the Navy Marine Court of Appeals, our client wasn't, there, there weren't criminal charges against him on ownership of a bump stock. He's challenging it civilly, but it is a criminal statute as well. And so that's why the rule of lenity uh, should apply there uh, too. Garrett. This, this question's for I guess it's on. Uh, this question's for John. So last November, Justice Gorsuch uh, issued a dissent from a denial of cert in Buffington in which he decried the rest of the court for not taking that case as a direct challenge to Chevron. Now that the court's accepted Loper Bright, do you think that something has changed within the conference? Do you think that it's the facts of this case that are different? And if so, even if you don't get a decision that you'd love, what would you be satisfied or what would you like to see um, if the court doesn't wholly overrule Chevron? So the government, Buffington- Can, can I just say that Buffington was our case? Yes, Buffington was our case. I was getting there. <laughs> oh, I'm I sorry. Know, I know. Uh, I jumped the gun. So, they, so Buffington was our case. And, and, and Justice Gorsuch actually took a lot of heat in the amicus briefs in this round because he said that Chevron isn't used a lot. And those of us who practice were, were gobsmacked by that statement because we think it, it colors everything. Um, but, but, but he's right in one sense, which is the government has this habit of saying Chevron, Chevron, Chevron in the district court and the court of appeals right, all the way up right. to the Supreme so Court. So he doesn't see it, and so, right? Yeah. So it's like, oh, yes, and you're August uh, uh, Chambers. You don't see it a lot, but I'm telling you, it's happening. When it gets to the Supreme Court, the agencies change their tune. They're like, Chevron, is that a case? I'm not familiar with that case. You know, it's <laughs> So the government has hit on, like I was saying, they've hit on stare decisis and reliance by both Congress and the agencies and all this, not by, not by the American people, by the way. But um, I, I think that, and, but the government has also said that this isn't a case of silence. They say since other parts of the Madison-Stevenson Act talk about charging for these observers, that this isn't an adequate case for silence. But I, I think that what the silence argument is, is that they're silent as to whether in this fishery, in these conditions, you can do this. And one of the things we have in Relentless, and so I'm very much hoping that they at least say silence in this area means no, you don't get the power, is that some of these appellate courts, the First Circuit particularly, are saying that it is just assumed that any regulatory cost can be put on the regulated. That's not the case. That's not true. Um, and Congress has many, many statutes that prevent you from charging or doing anything that doesn't go into the federal treasury. And, and this is the reason for it. So I hope Chevron is overturned, but I certainly think that if, uh, exclusio uno, if they've said you could do this in one area, it doesn't mean you can do it anywhere else. Uh, and that silence argument, I think, would be a compromise 
for those who don't want to immediately get rid of Chevron, who are worried that we've overturned too many cases or whatever it is, even though the Supreme Court has not. Um, so a, a, a decent outcome would be that silence um, in this part of the statute doesn't allow you to do what they do somewhere else. That seems to me to be just normal statutory interpretation and should certainly be expected regardless of what they do with Chevron. The other thing I would say about that is the, the, the court tends to not necessarily grant cert the first time one of these issue comes up, but it, it does the second, the third time it comes up, they're like, okay, well, this is a recurring issue. And I think Buffington helped show, and partly because of the reaction to what <laughs> courts had said, uh, that this is a real issue that needs the court's uh, attention. And we had that same and phenomenon I also, it, it in is other my, cases. It is my pet theory that Srinivasan of the DC Circuit has been poking them, poking mm-hmm. them on Chevron. He, Deciding everything based yes, on Chevron. because the lower court said, ah, it's clear. You can put these monitors in charge for them. The DC had, and so I said, no, no, no. We only get there through Chevron. Here you go, boys. I mean, I, I think that, I, I, I do. That is my pet theory, but that's what I think. <laughs> Multiple people asked some version of the question about Missouri v. Biden. The question is uh, that what happened, what happened at the appellate court to the standard of when something rises to the level of censorship. So people are confused about whether we should be happy that the the injunction was upheld or should we be upset because of the the standard was raised because now only the worst coercion will count as censorship. So there's just a lot of confusion about whether we should be going yay or boo and what is gonna happen at at the Supreme Court. Yay or boo, John? I, I, think it's, I think it's a yay. And it's a yay because just like in baseball, you don't get home runs every time, but you want to get to first base. And what's happened with some of these arguments in other courts and elsewhere is that you don't even get into the stadium. So I, I believe that this is a huge win. And the fact that what the Fifth Circuit said was that this, um, you know, this suggestion, their test is not... Uh, a model of clarity, I will say. But if the question is, is this an advance? Except for the name of it. They cleared that up. Yeah, exactly. It's the close nexus test. The close they were very clear about test. that. So they went, they put in a footnote. It's very funny because other courts have had given it different names. They've given it different names and they say, oh, we're going to straighten this out right now. This vague test that we're making will be called the close <laughs> nexus test. Uh, I wouldn't say vague. I would say, I would say difficult to determine what facts they're looking at. Here, the problem is, the problem is the facts in this case are so overwhelming. They go on for 83 pages in the district court. They're so, the, they, and the government is still saying we meant to do that and we'll do it again. This is not a case where they're saying we didn't do anything or we only talked to them once or. or they're they're not disputing the facts. Yeah. The government is they not disputing, disputing the facts. They, they censored say, and they're still doing it. Yeah, they say this is fine. If we call up and yell at these people of profanity and threaten to take away their 230 protections, we could do it all the long day, and that's perfectly fine. Um, That's their argument. Just another day at the office. Yeah, that's That's we're telling them our views repeatedly, all the time, in secret, Um, and that's okay. With with veiled threats. Yeah, so I I believe that part of the, the problem, if problem there be, is the facts here are so overwhelming that the Fifth Circuit had a wealth uh, overflowing wealth of what it could do because if, if this is going to be the high watermark, I mean, rarely do you have the government doing this many bad things to the First Amendment and not not tacking to the wind at any point. That's what they're doing here. And, and I guess I'd say may, maybe a, a little bit different that, uh, yes, I think it's a win. I do think that the Fifth Circuit uh, it, you can read that opinion and think that you have to have coercion in order to have state action. And that's just not the test. It never has been the test, particularly when we're not suing the private parties here. We're not saying that the actions of the private parties are state action in in that sense. We're saying that the government's actions are the things that violate the First Amendment. What they've done uh, is, uh, you know, is is not allowed. And what they've done doesn't have to rise to the level of coercion in order to violate the First Amendment. Right, but it's not even clear from the opinion that it requires coercion. It that's, doesn't, it that's says. Why it's, that's why it's difficult to discern. But what Mark's saying and what the questioner's saying is, I think, correct. I just don't think it's a problem under these facts because no matter how you look at it under this test, yeah. they're gonna measure it. And let's say the Supreme Court 
either turns this down or takes this test. This test in future cases will still be more useful than what we've got from some of these courts because mostly they always say, well, the government gets to say what it wants. And even when it's saying what it wants is in Judge Willett's word, nice social media platform you got there. Shame if anything happened to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, think that, I, I think that that's still in advance because right now, um, just like in the rent control, they were told they could do a little bit of rent control back in World War II, and now it's like, oh, you never raise the rent. It's a, you give them this much and off they go. This stops giving them that much. And in that way, at least it's an advance. Does this case uh, present any issue of the public's right to hear or read? Yes, well, Absolutely. this is the other thing. Yeah, okay. So the government says that, our, that, we've, that we, the, the, the plaintiffs, have just invented this right to hear other views. Well, the Supreme Court has talked about a right to receive other views. Um, and so we say that not only do our plaintiffs have their right to speak, but there's all these people they follow, like Alex Berenson and all these other type of people, um, who they can't hear because they get thrown off the internet. Um, and so there is that issue, and the government is poo-pooing it. They're going, they're saying, there's no such right, and that case didn't strictly hold this and all that, but um, I think there is such a right, and I think that- if this And so case, does the Supreme Court. And, and I think so does the Supreme Court, but the Solicitor General is not backing down. And so I think that if this goes up, we'll get a clear statement about that, that you do have. And what does that help with? What do we all love? Standing. It helps with standing for everybody. Yeah. But, but I do think John's right. I do, I do think that uh, the Judge Willett does talk about significant encouragement, entanglement. It's not limited uh, to coercion. Uh, but that's how the government will try to use it in the future. I'm Particularly afraid. significant encouragement. I mean, if this isn't significant encouragement, it does not exist. <laughs> Yeah. Michael Maybach with James Wilson Institute. Um, I know you're not covering this today, but we've seen in the last several months the President of the United States put aside, whether it's Alaska or New Mexico, you know, energy production in the country just by a stroke of the pen. Is this something that you would look at at, at NCLA? Well, it would depend if there were a, you know, if there were a particular administrative action uh, that, uh, that, a, that a particular agency took that we thought was violating someone's civil liberties, because that's the, that's the lens through which we, which we look at this. So there have been cases, and, and Rich, I, I can't remember if, if you and I worked on this case together or not, but uh, involving Alaska, where there was a permit that had been granted, this was several years ago, and then the government came after the permit was granted and revoked it. I mean, those are the kinds of things that we think the administrative state does that are problematic. Yes. Thank you. Is there, uh, is there a danger that, uh, because that's what the press had said, uh, the online questioner said, look, the, when, when Jarkissi came down, it was like, oh my gosh, they're, they're, they're gonna destroy the SEC. Right. You know, all of that's gonna go away. Is that what, is that what we're up to with our, uh, with, with, with our suits against the SEC? Well, the SEC can always go into federal court exactly. and make these very right. same claims. And in fact, Russ has been doing studies of what the SEC has been doing recently. And I think the Jarkissi decision and others have kind of scared them away from doing these administrative law judge yeah, cases. Since, since Lu Lucia, they really haven't been assigning cases to ALJs. So are you saying there's been some corrective uh, effect? I'm saying NCLA has them quaking in their boots, is what I'm, is what I'm saying. And they did, in all honesty. I mean, I, I don't know if we've talked about this on here uh, before, but the SEC dismissed 42 cases in the wake of our victory in the Cochran uh, case uh, last term. So it's, uh, it's a big deal. But uh, as, as Russ and, and Rich alluded to, the SEC is still welcome to uh, go to federal district court and try to convince a real judge with a real jury uh, that someone has violated the securities clause. And that's what it should get back uh, to doing and stop this, this uh, uh, unconstitutional detour that Dodd-Frank uh, put the agency uh, on. With that, uh, let me uh, thank John and Rich and, and Russ for their, uh, for their thoughtful treatment of all these uh, cases, both the ones that CERT has already been granted on and the ones that, that CERT has been pending on. I would invite you to join us uh, for our luncheon on next month, where I think we're going to be uh, talking about uh, our Dressen case and uh, uh, in which we represent some clients who were uh, vax who in one case actually volunteered for the COVID vaccine trials and was vaccine injured, diagnosed as such by the National Institutes of Health, and yet, not unlike the Missouri v. Biden situation, she, she tried to set up 
uh, and in fact has set up some online uh, support groups. Support groups is the best way to describe it for other people who are vaccine injured. And the government has been shutting those support groups down. They don't even want the vaccine injured to be able to talk to each other and get solace uh, from each other, which is which is horrible. So we're going to talk about that issue uh, next month. Uh, but for now, if you would join me in thanking our panelists. Thank